Thank you very much, Kate. So, of course, uh, as is self-evident, uh, all great inventions in the biomedical uh, sciences begin with the science. So like Gleevec and Taxol and the other things that we're very excited about uh, in treating patients, it starts with the good science and it starts here. So many of you attend scientific meetings. Usually the whole thing is presentations by individuals and then there are three people up at the podium and time is up and everybody wants to leave and they never get a chance to banter back and forth and answer questions. So we're going to do it just the opposite way. The, the, the major portion uh, of this afternoon is to really give the individuals who are the panel members a chance to develop this concept of converting science to technology. So uh, I introduced Remy Barbier as the, uh, the chairman and CEO of Pain Therapeutics. And one may ask, what is a company by the name of Pain Therapeutics doing with melanoma? And in fact, uh, I believe they, they chose, chose that name because the first product that they began to develop was a product that was uh, designed to treat chronic pain. But of course, all disease causes pain in one way or the other. And uh, the company is now involved in melanoma therapy, in uh, developing drugs for chronic pain, and interestingly enough, developing a new technology using gene therapy for hemophilia B. So it's a much broader company than pain therapeutics. Uh, and uh, we want to thank Remy from, for flying out from California to be with our panel today. So uh, I want to start off the discussion with you, Kate, because you ended off with the fact that you, um, you submitted an invention disclosure. So how difficult was that? Was this a big deal? And I asked the question because all of you out there uh, have to be faced with this concept of an invention disclosure. How difficult was it to fill out an invention disclosure? Well, I think uh, it, it took us some time, but uh, it wasn't difficult because anybody who looked at uh, Einstein invention disclosure form, um, I think would agree with me that uh, the questions which one has to answer are pretty straightforward, and that's what you always think anyway when you have that first thoughts in your head about maybe it could be commercialized, maybe it could become a drug, you know, or like a diagnosis kit or something like that. So the questions basically ask you, uh, you know, what potential market is out there to to whom uh, this invention uh, would bring some benefits and uh, what stage is your invention in basically uh, you performed only in vitro experiments so far or maybe in vivo experiments what else you need to do who are your collaborators what are the funding sources so this is really straightforward and self-guiding sort of form and um, I, I don't think it actually uh, you know takes a lot of time or effort it does take some thought but you, you're thinking about your potential Mention anyway to fill in that form. <laughs> so, John, uh, you get a disclosure from a faculty person. Uh, two, two questions. One, what happens to it? What's the process that um, continues after the submission of a disclosure? And also, when should faculty be thinking of presenting a disclosure to the Office of Biotechnology versus preparing a manuscript or submitting a manuscript? Oh, well, I guess I'll answer the first, the second question first, and that is clearly it's in the, the inventor's interest to file the invention disclosure with us to give us time to file a patent application well in advance of submitting a manuscript for publication because the consequences of publishing before we have a chance to file the patent application is that you lose foreign rights. So basically when there's a public disclosure, which would be your, your manuscript being published, the, you have one year in the United States to still, still file a patent application. But if that publication comes out before you file the patent application, you've lost the ability to file internationally. So there is a, a timing issue here with all of our invention disclosures. The, the first part of your question about what happens is that Einstein has a, a patent committee uh, this committee is charged with evaluating new invention disclosures and then making a recommendation to the dean on whether or not the school should file a patent application. Uh, the, chair, the, the committee is chaired by David Rosenstreich, 
All of the voting members are faculty members, Einstein faculty, so this really is a, a committee of your peers. And when they receive an invention disclosure, they look at it from, I'll say, from three perspectives. You know, first is, is the underlying science sound? Is there, the second issue would be, is this, is this new? Is it novel? Is it useful? Um, is this truly a new invention? And then the third area that they have to look at is, does it have commercial potential? And this is very important because you have to understand that just to get to the point of filing, say, a U.S. utility application, it can cost as much as $20,000. And to get to an issued patent, that amount can double. So this is every in invention disclosure that we go forward with is a significant investment on the part of the college. So it can be a wonderful science. It can be a great new idea. But if there's not at least the potential for a commercial return, it's the, res the committee's responsibility not to recommend going forward. So the patent committee meets, and um, let's say they decide to proceed with patenting. Then what does your office do then? Well, sort of two things. One, the, f the next step is obviously we send it to patent counsel. We use outside um, patent counsel with instructions usually to go ahead and file a patent application or at times they'll do an initial evaluation to determine whether if there are questions about the patentability they'll initially do an evaluation and provide us feedback on that and it may, that's a decision point. If not, the typical approach is that we instruct patent counsel to go forward and they'll follow, file what's called a provisional, a U.S. provisional patent application. So. The Office of Biotechnology is involved in several aspects of this process. One is getting these inventions patented. But uh, more important for the scientist or the inventor is getting them licensed. So what is licensing? How do you license things? What does licensing mean? And specifically, uh, what did you try to do for the melanoma invention? So well, licensing, in effect, is, is finding a commercial partner and giving them the rights to develop the technology and take it forward. Uh, in a case like this, it's an exclusive license where and Remy has a, what's called a worldwide exclusive license. In other words, nobody else can practice this. We haven't given anyone else the right to practice any of these technologies. The typical process is we'll start with a marketing campaign. Richard Cosman, who's now director of the Office of Biotechno uh, Business Development, Will put, has put together, in this case, marketing materials and targeted a number of U.S. and international biotech, biotech firms, uh, big pharma, <coughs> venture capital groups, and life science entrepreneurs. And it's sort of a targeted approach, trying to find partners that we think would be a good match and solicit their interest. Uh, in this case, we actually had probably over 30 different entities that were willing to receive uh, non-confidential information on this technology. So it generated some interest. So part of the judgment of the office is uh, trying to figure out to whom to license. And that involves our trust in the company, uh, the management of the company, and a track record. And as it turns out, uh, Einstein had previously licensed some technology to pain therapeutics. So Remy, I want to um, turn to you now. Uh, you were contacted by the office, and you were shown this opportunity. So what were your thoughts? What did you think about this technology when you first saw it? Uh, that's an easy one. My initial thought was it'll never work. Uh, it'll never work because from a clinical development perspective, melanoma, especially metastatic melanoma, <clears throat> has been a graveyard for the biopharmaceutical industry. And there are some very good reasons for this. But before I get into the specifics of uh, why this technology, uh, I want to say I kind of get a kick out of uh, 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 kind of the flow of the discussion going from science to commercialization. Between science and commercialization, you got this little thing called clinical development. And speaking of commercialization, while you're still at the scientific stages, is a little bit like 
being single and talking about your grandparents or your grandkids or something. It's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a long ways to go between. Uh, we do that middle ground. Uh, we're not uh, experts in the science, and we're not uh, really experts in commercialization. Our expertise is really defined as uh, taking a test tube and figuring it out whether or not it actually represents a viable uh, drug, a viable therapy for patients. Um, it's, it's an expertise, and like any expertise, there are you know, a number of uh, quirks to it. Um, in the case of um, uh, you know, Arturo and Kate and Joshua's technology, uh, after I got past my it'll never work thought, um, I read all of the, uh, the associated publications. I had a number of informal discussions. I think we, we talked a couple of times, Kate, with uh, Arturo. And uh, what I like to do, it's just Remy, um, I will go. I will read and digest all the materials on a Friday, and I'll go on a very long bike ride over the weekend. And just think about it. And the reason I like to think about it almost on a subconscious, if not informal th basis, is because whereas John here has to decide where to invest his tens of thousands of dollars, we have to decide where to invest our tens of millions of dollars. And when you're talking about you know, trying to invest, make a decision on uh, where to put your, your 10, 20, 30, 50 million bucks, th there's, no science, you know, there's no book that you can go to and say, okay, this is how you decide. Uh, but there are a number of kind of internal flow charts that you follow. And for me, uh, what we do is really, it's, it's a relationship. Yes, there's a lot of clinical science involved. Uh, yes, there's a lot of hard thinking involved. But the, for me, really, the foundation is what is the relationship like? There has to be a, a, common, a, a common base of values. Uh, a value of hard work, a value of you know, rigorous thinking, a value uh, of debate, a value of, of just intellectual honesty and calling a spade a spade. And this I typically get through informal discussions with people like Kate and, and uh, Arturo and others and, and also the uh, Office of Biology, uh, uh, Biotechnology. And once you get past kind of uh, is there a cultural value here, uh, do we share the same type of values, you have to ask some of the, the more rigorous uh, type rational decisions such as, okay, what's the market potential? If I really have to invest 50 million bucks, how do I look at investors with a straight face and say, okay, I think I can get a return on your investment? More importantly, how do I approach the FDA and say, uh, this is not smoke and mirrors, this is for real? And the FDA kind of thinks like me, only even more cynically. You know, if I'm saying that graveyard, uh, metastatic melanoma has been a graveyard, from the FDA's perspective, it's been a nightmare. I mean, imagine you're sitting at the FDA table and, you know, everything they've ever, th industry has ever thrown at you has failed for 20 years. They get your dossier on, on metastatic melanoma and, you know, they fall asleep. So uh, the trick is, you know, how do you keep the FDA awake and, and become credible? and uh, more importantly, get clarity on how to get from here to an approval. It's a very, very tricky process, and there are no, again, there are no guidelines. Uh, but you talk to former regulatory uh, people, you talk to advisors, you talk to people who've been there before, you talk to clinicians, you talk to patients. Uh, again, that theme of a relationship comes to mind. You just talk and you listen. You ask a lot of hard questions. Assuming all those things check, um, we call back John and say, you know what, I think this thing's got a shot, what do you want for it? And John will say, well, you know, I need $100 million up front and 20% royalty, and you go, okay, yeah, yeah. What do you really want for it? So then you come to terms. Um, actually, and you know, some companies, if not some people, make careers out of negotiating these things. I don't. We have a template at Pain Therapeutics, my company, about what we can pay for our early stage technology. And very early up front, I say, this is our template. Here's how we've done two, three science uh, deals before. Uh, if you think your technology fits our template, happy to talk and tweak what works for you. But I'm not going to make a career out of a, you know, negotiating something that <clears throat> uh, I may not be able to. Uh, fortunately for both myself and uh, Office of uh, Biotechnology, everyone was very reasonable. Uh, I think we did disclose our template as evidenced by our earlier uh, transaction with, uh, with John. And, you know, we reached a um, um, kind of a mutual ground and signed the paperwork, called the lawyers, paid them a lot of money, and then signed the paperwork. Um, part of the, the process 
uh, and probably the most important component here at the early stages is getting the scientists involved. Without scientific and without involvement of the scientific uh, uh, kind of parents, if you will, I, I will not touch a uh, new technology. So if Kate or Arturo or others had said, you know, look, here's here's everything we have, you know, pay us, goodbye, good luck, I'm out. Um, what we're looking for, as in any relationship, is a give and take. And of course, that costs money, so we don't mind. In fact, we want to pay for uh, you know, research collaboration. We want to offer financial support. I think it's both a uh, it's good business, but also it's, uh, uh, it's good for the program. In fact, it's a necessity for the program. <clears throat> so while, uh, while, while, you're, while you're catching your breath there, you're engaging the scientists, and presumably, uh, and I say this for the audience because you know the answer, uh, you, you would want them to be consultants to the company. Um, so this is a good thing, I presume. It's, it's not just a good thing, it's a necessary thing. So w one of the aspects of this relationship between uh, the academic uh, university and uh, working with companies is managing appropriately the ability of a faculty member to carry on their responsibilities of, as a faculty person uh, and to do this without a conflict of interest or a conflict of commitment. And that's one of the things that good partners, mm -hmm. such as, as Remy, allow our faculty to do. So they are able to act as consultants for the company, being monitored all along for conflict of interest, uh, through John and through Mike Reichgott and other people uh, who are involved in these things, but yet provide useful advisory role and be recompensed actually mm -hmm. as consultants. And I think that is part of the responsible activity and responsible conduct of research uh, that has to go on anywhere. Uh, so Kate, you, you uh, it was alluded to that uh, Remy wanted to sponsor research in your laboratory or Josh's or combined laboratory. Uh, how useful uh, was this research money? What did it, what it allow you to do? I don't mean the specific experiments, but uh, was this important? Well, it was very important because um, the uh, way we performed the experiments in mice, which were sort of proof of principle experiments, and the way we labeled antibody and do all other, um, you know, procedures leading to the radio-labeled product. Uh, they are working in the lab, but uh, those methods and those procedures are not suitable for uh, translating it without any change into humans, right? Because uh, everything uh, which goes into humans have to be performed uh, in sort of GMP uh, uh, facility, be sterile, uh, pass all those uh, sterility perigenicity tests, and h has to be uh, not foolproof, but you know, it will be performed by not a scientist, but by, in this case, for example, a nuclear medicine technologist, in a, wearing the whole a suit, you know, in GMP facilities. So you have to make the whole procedure extremely uh, robust and working in failure th three, uh, for free. So um, when we had that agreement with uh, Pain Therapeutics for uh, that they will give us money for research, that's what we spent two years in collaboration with, uh, you know, researchers from Pain and from Goodwin Biotechnology, and that's what we did. We completely rewarmed the whole um, radio labeling procedure. I mean, we made it um, much more easy and straightforward and robust than it was before. Purification also, because the radio labeled antibody still contains some free isolation. Top. Purification also took us maybe a year uh, to figure out how to do that purification in that GMP uh, suite. But uh, also, uh, when we were doing it, there is, uh, you know, always some time when, when you, uh, you know, say doing some experiments uh, required by this. But you also have some free time, uh, and uh, during those years, we performed a lot of experiments which sort of move uh, that treatment further. 
further. We, uh, for example, did a lot of experiments with peptides, um, which are binding to melanin, and those also were made by Josh when he was in Arturo's lab. We radio labeled them, performed mouse experiments, published the results, proved that that could be in the future potential uh, uh, alternative vehicle for treatment of melanoma. Can, can I interrupt? And, uh, yeah. So this sponsored research and the work that you actually did, did that have any positive uh, or neutral effect on your, your day job, which is uh, NIH-funded research? Were you able to use some of the data that was generated from the company-sponsored research and apply that to new applications to NIH? Yes, it's definitely uh, possible, and uh, we did it. Not that, you know, like NIH was very welcomed, <laughs> because as I said, I mean, melanoma community is very exclusive, and, uh, you know, for somebody from completely different field to break in, uh, it is difficult. But, yeah, I mean, uh, those results, they helped us a lot in grants application and uh, in uh, publishing a lot of papers. I'd like to add a, a point about this. Um, it's also very important from a, uh, the industry perspective that the scientific and clinical partner not treat us as a bank. We have a good nose for sniffing out those who might treat us as a bank. Uh, likewise, it's important for us as an industrial partner not to treat the scientists and the clinicians as, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, once a quarter uh, consultants, if you will. Um, it truly is a relationship, and it only works uh, as hard as the both parties uh, are willing to make it work. And part of feeding the relationship, obviously, is our uh, our resources, but also the scientific input into making the uh, the drug development effort a uh, or the scientific effort a, a drug development effort. One other point uh, worth mentioning is. Um, you know, as, as clinicians and as um, uh, researchers, you have the practical ability and the legal authority to do all sorts of things that we in industry cannot do, either on a practical basis or on a legal basis, i.e., the uh, clinicians in this room are licensed uh, to go in and kind of, you know, you can test a few low-dose drugs in selective patient populations and probably get away with it. And if you see some benefit, that's great. You can kind of increase the, uh, okay, we, we can't do that. <laughs> in fact, we go to jail. Um, of course, it never happens here, but you know, no. the other school across we the street. Have an I we have an IRB and we have a process and one can do pilot projects uh, yeah. with IRB approval. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, but all this to say that there are uh, some you know, very, very high hurdles that industry has to go through in terms of making the compound GMP, uh, making the studies GMP, et cetera, et cetera, things that you, know, you probably don't want to hear about, you don't need to know about, other than you do need to know that the hurdle rate for us industry to get into patients is much, much higher than, uh, than you know, clinicians and physicians. So since you, uh, you brought up the issue of money, uh, I want to turn to John and uh, concentrate a little bit, mainly for the audience. Can you uh, tell us what a typical licensing uh, type of agreement involves in terms of dollars? I mean, you're asking, I guess we didn't get the $100 million? I'm not No, we sure. didn't. We didn't. Okay. So without getting into the, uh, the exact details, in terms of categories, what, what type of, of dollars are you looking for and for what purposes? Uh, I won't get into right now the, the magnitude of the, the payments um, up front or, or initially. Um, basically, this, we have sort of our template as well, which sort of fits pretty neatly with, with Remy's. And we did have the advantage of having done a, an agreement probably six years prior to that with uh, another technology. So we had a history of working together and we already knew what was important to each other. Uh, again, this being a, an exclusive license, uh, Remy's template, which meets with our template, is they're all, it's pretty consistent with what most academic institutions do. Uh, we expect an upfront license fee. We expect annual maintenance payments to keep the license active. Uh, we expect payment for go-forward patent expenses, which can become significant over time. Um, there's going to be clinical development milestones, so as Remy hits certain milestones in the clinical development, uh, our perception is it adds value to the technology, and so we're entitled to a payment at that point. 
and there's a royalty on sales. So when it does get into the market and Remy starts to generate a revenue stream, we expect to share in that revenue stream. This agreement, which it happens in a lot of our exclusive licenses, but this one did have the provision for research, uh, two years of sponsored research up front. And in the four years since the license has been in effect, we've amended the license three times, each, each time to extend the research for an additional year. So I noticed that neither you nor Dr. Spiegel are driving a Bentley. So when you say we get these money, monies up front and maintenance payments, uh, exactly what happens with this money? Uh, we have a patent policy, and the patent policy dictates how money, how income gets distributed. And so most of you who are inventors realize that a third of the in net income goes personally to the inventors. A third of the income goes to a research account in their names, and that's a, a purely discretionary fund. It doesn't have to be spent, in this case, on developing uh, the, the RIT indications. And a third goes to the college, which, in this case, just talking a little bit about the income to the inventors, it was an interesting challenge in that um, the initial patent portfolio that we licensed to Remy included four patents. and each patent had three inventors. So that's, we're dealing with 12 different, I'll say stakeholders, which were seven different individuals. So when that first check comes in from Remy, which is gonna be 30 days after we sign the license, we have to figure out how to divvy up this first check, that one third among the inventors. And so it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a daunting challenge when you try to determine what's the equal weight of each patent or what's the weight, the contribution of each individual inventor. And Actually, it's a challenge I put back on the inventors because I can't, I can't assess the relative value and I can't assess the contribution of each individual inventor. So I worked primarily with Kate and Arturo and made them understand that we're not going to distribute any of the money until every one of the inventors have agreed to the distribution and signed a letter uh, to that effect. So, so we have two inventors in the room. Uh, are you both happy with how this worked out? <laughs> oh, I guess we overpaid. <laughs> so just to give you a frame of reference, I won't tell you how the category stacked up, but we're a little over four years into the license, and Remy's paid us uh, over $1.6 million so far, a little over half of that going to, to sponsored research. So it's been, um, Einstein has benefited from the relationship. Okay. Let me uh, put that in perspective with uh, how much money, how much capital we have put into the program. As of, let's see, mid-September, we have clinical data, I want to say on about 13 patients. In the four years since signing on the dotted line, we probably have put in over $20 million. It's real cash. It's a lot of money, uh, over a million and a half per, uh, per patient. And that gives you some idea of how careful and how selective we need to be on the front end because at that rate, you know, there are only so many shots on goal we can take until we run out of cash, which is bad for everybody. Um, so anyway, that was just a, a point of perspective. Well, that, let's, let's that, continue, Remy. So after you, you got the invention, uh, you started off your own introduction that your company and other biotech companies take the science and before it becomes a commercial product, you have to develop it. So what went into the development and tell us something about what a clinical trial is and, and, and where you are with these things. Okay, you, you want to hear about the, the actual clinical trial, the pilot trial or the, uh, well, for first, the steps that involved? Before you got to your first human subject, what, what, had, to, what uh, had to happen? Okay. We're going to have um, to take you through how you spent your $20 million. <laughs> uh, the first thing that has to happen is we need to uh, verify all of the data and essentially repeat many of the experiments, only repeat it under conditions of uh, what's called GLP, good lab uh, uh, practices. Um, so first thing we do is we essentially take the recipe for making the antibody in this case and uh, taking the generator apart and rebuilding it so that we can uh, really kind of build a, a recipe, if you will, uh, an FDA 
a recipe that the FDA could, I don't want to say prove, but at least um, get over the, some of the regulatory hurdles. That whole process, of it's called technical development. It's long, it's boring, uh, it's necessary, it's highly complex and detailed work. Uh, that's the first thing that happens, and typically this takes, you know, if we're really fast, it takes about a year to a year and a half. I think in this case it took about a year to make the uh, uh, GM, uh, GMP material on the antibody. Uh, so first is antibody uh, technical development. Then we have to test the, uh, the drug and animals uh, for safety all over again. So you, you kind of go up the scale, low doses, and you go all the way up the scale to what's called maximum tolerated dose, and then you kind of back off from there. Then you have to redo it all over again for, you know, so-called animal efficacy. Now, folks, you know, cancer has been cured in mice decades ago. So, you know, I take mice data with a, um, you know, a little bit of salt. But uh, it, it's, it's one of those necessary steps. So we had to repeat many of those experiments. Um, and by the way, I'm skipping everything that, you know, all the radioisotope work because that would take another hour to explain. So anyway, once you get to the point where you're fairly comfortable that you have FDA, you know, that you have data that by FDA standards will meet their tests and that your drug will meet their tests, you go into the, uh, the first patient. And that is a very, very scary moment. It's very scary because despite all your hard work and despite all your best guesses and the advice of, you know, the best minds on the planet, you don't know if you're going to do any harm. And, you know, as everyone in this room knows, uh, do no harm. That's, uh, that's the first uh, uh, standard that we, we impose on ourselves. Uh, in this case, we felt pretty good that there would be, you know, I mean, you never say zero, you never speak of zero risk, but acceptable risk because of what we've seen and uh, previously had seen in animals. Having said that, this is an IgM antibody, so you always, you know, IgM antibodies are, they're way out there, you know, in their own kind of outer space land. Uh, so you want to be ultra, ultra careful. So we were hyper conservative and started with an ultra low dose of antibody. Again, kind of working our way up the scale. Then uh, that was the, what they called the cold antibody without the radioisotope. And then once we got some relative comfort on the activity, the biological activity of the antibody, uh, we attached a, a very small dose of the radioisotope. Kate, I forget, maybe. I, I don't know if it's 10 millicuries. Th 10 millicuries of the radioisotope, which is, you know, it's, it's trivial. Um, especially given that these patients, they're all, you know, they're dying. This is all uh, in patients, not in healthy volunteers. Uh, and then you work your way up the scale where you increase the antibody, increase the radioisotope, increase one, increase the, and you kind of work your way up until you get to a point of, um, again, I don't want to say maximum tolerated dose, but kind of acceptable. Um, you know, acceptable side effects in patients who are, who are faced with, you know, essentially a death sentence. And then you back off from the dose, and that becomes the actual uh, proposed clinical dose for a real, uh, you know, pilot clinical trial. So where are we today? Four years into the effort, we're probably a couple, I would say three or four months before we can actually define the dose where we see real biological activity that in our estimate, in the est collective estimate, uh, would probably correspond to a clinical activity in a, a dying patient. So stay tuned. We're, it's, it's, it, it's kind of exciting in a way because we're almost there. We're almost at the start, but we're not quite there, but we can certainly see it just months away. So I have two more questions. So Kate, as a scientist, how do you feel or how did you feel where the laboratory effort that you and Josh and, and Arturo engaged in as scientists, what was your emotional reaction to the fact that this was now being tried in human subjects who had melanoma? Well, I think it feels extremely gratifying that, you know, when you do your research and you always hope for the best, for the stellar results, but, you know, uh, sometimes and your results are really nice, but they're just not trans translatable into, um, you know, the, the clinic. But here, uh, you know, and uh, plus, you know, uh, it wasn't easy for us, as I said, to break into melanoma field. There was a lot of frustration, rejection of the papers. And when finally it, it became clear that after all those efforts and the development, we will be uh, in people, say, in, in a month or in a week. And then um, in spring of 2007, I went uh, to Jerusalem where the clinic 
clinical trial is conducted just to help the um, doctors over there with the uh, radio labeling part. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, unbelievable feeling that in a couple of weeks, uh, the first patient will be injected with something which was in the lab and it, which was just a dream and, you know, we made it all, all the way to the point. So, last, last question. Yeah, can, can I add something? Um, you know, it's very important to us that we actually see uh, the twinkle in scientists' eyes when we're, we're close to that first patient. Um, again, and that's because we don't want to be thought of as kind of, you know, the dumb practical partner who just does the work and, and that's it. Uh, we need scientists who are really turned on by uh, making a difference, making an impact on clinical medicine. If you don't get your jollies on uh, making a difference in patients, it's probably not the right thing to do. On the other hand, if you, know, you really enjoy your research, but in addition, uh, you also want to make a real impact on clinical medicine, by all means, you know, come up with some crazy invention. Talk to people. Uh, and I have to say, I will say up front, eight out of ten inventions are, you know, a little bit crazy, and that's okay, because it takes craziness to come up with one or two really practical good inventions. So never hesitate. But you've got to be, uh, you, you have to be turned on by the thought of making a difference in patients. So that actually was my last question. What, what, do, you, what do you say to prospective inventors to turn them on? And, and that's a perfect answer. I want to thank everybody for coming and thank our panelists. And thank Janice again.